Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isratel here for Renaissance Periodization, strength training made simple, video number two, what is proper lifting technique? Let's break it down. Proper technique has, oh, I've counted six requirements. Let's go through them one by one. First of all, proper strength training lift technique utilizes the most muscle possible to generate the most force possible in positions in which the muscles are their strongest. For example, if you want to bench the most, there are two parts of your pec generally, the sternal pectoralis and the clavicular pectoralis. Now the sternal one is huge, the clavicular one is usually smaller. So in order to bench the most, don't just bench like this, you want to arch and retract to put your sternal pecs into the best possible position to generate a ton of force. If you're lifting in such a way that doesn't put your biggest and strongest muscles on the table, you're not going to be able to be as strong as otherwise. Number two, very related, you want the lift, the actual technique that you use in the lift to be leveraged to produce the most force possible and to lift the highest amount of numerical load because at the end of the day, strength is about lifting as much as possible. For example, do you get a better quad workout, low bar squatting or high bar squatting? Probably high bar squatting, but low bar squats for most people allow simply to squat more weight, which is to say over time that will absolutely make you stronger at squatting more weight. So low bar squatting is a real good idea if you want your strength to improve, at least in the short term. High bar squatting can be used to build up general strength and hypertrophy in the muscles of the lower body, but eventually low bar squat is really the tip of the spear. Another example, the deadlift bar in a deadlift has to be really close to your legs and as close to your center of gravity as possible because that maximizes your leverage advantage. If you deadlift all the way out here, you're going to be deadlifting a tiny fraction of what you can. So a lot of times when coaches who coach lifter technique will move your knees out or move them in or move your hands out, move them in, what they're trying to do is maximize that leverage advantage. It's an art as well as a science. So every lifter is built differently and a really good coach will watch how you move and try to pick a stance, a position, and a bar path that maximizes your individual leverage advantage. Number three, the technique you want to choose is not needlessly fatiguing, damaging, or unsafe. And that's both in the long term as you beat your body up or hopefully less and in the short term of like you're going to hurt yourself doing that right now. So for example, if you dive bomb your squats, you might consider not doing that because that's not a sustainable strategy. It exposes you acutely to a lot of risk any one time. And chronically, it might be exposing you to a slightly higher risk just because there's acute risk. Now, chronically, it probably won't damage structures anymore, but acutely at any one time, it's a risky strategy. Another one is what you can call candy cane deadlifting, just rounding the shit out of your whole back and trying to like be born again. And, you know, you could lift a lot of weight doing that. The thing is, Maybe chronically and definitely acutely, that strategy is likely to increase the chance of spinal injury by a small amount, but by an amount that should be concerning to you as you lift more and more weight, which is when you see advanced lifters that are still around, usually they have some degree of tightness in their back. They're not relaxing their back at the bottom of the lift and using it concentrically the whole time. They're usually staying tighter so that the hips do more of the work, not exposing their spine to such unfortunate positions. So if you look at someone's lift and they're doing something that is effective as far as lifting a lot of weight, but looks dangerous either from an acute or chronic perspective, there may be an intervention there where you change their technique or if it's your own technique and they actually get weaker for a little while because the body has to get used to new technique. But once it's used to it, they'll be both safer and stronger in the long term. Now, on the getting used to so the new technique issue is point number four. You need to have a technique that can be replicated session to session for tracking to make sure you're actually getting stronger. If you move the bar on the bench down a certain way each time, sometimes halfway down, sometimes more, how do you know if your bench is actually getting stronger? So there needs to be an objective, usually determinant of how the technique looks. If you know the technique is similar time to time, you can actually make sure that you are getting stronger at the rate you think you are and you're not just fooling yourself. It's like asking people who half squat in the gym, how much do you squat? It doesn't matter what they say. They actually don't know because they're not doing a real squat. Another thing to that last point, the more you practice any given technique, the better you get at it. If your technique is different every time, 
it's kind of like going to a different English-speaking country every single time and trying to understand people as well as possible. Yeah, they speak English in Australia and in Scotland and in New Zealand, but it's a little bit different slang and it's kind of, it takes a little bit getting used to. If you want to be your strongest, you don't want to have to get used to anything. You want to be on very, very common ground, super common conditions. So if you really want to learn how they speak English in Scotland, you should be living in Scotland for a while, like as long as possible. So if you want to get really, really good at deadlifting, if your deadlift is very similar each time, your body learns how to operate under those exact mechanics and begins to get really, really good at them. So when you show up to a powerlifting meet, you don't have to play a guessing game. You know exactly what your technique is going to be, and it's something your body is well-practiced at and really, really good at. So that means for the non-beginner lifter, and probably through the beginner stages, this is something you want to start thinking about, knowing exactly and remembering and replicating where you put your hands, your hips, your feet, your head, and just trying to do the same thing over and over and over. It also means shitty coaches during a powerlifting meet will tell you to alter your technique wildly if you miss a lift. Real stupid idea, because even if your technique is very suboptimal, that's the technique you're used to. To make a lift happen, maybe just a small alteration of technique is a good idea, and ideally no alteration, just a little bit of psychological input. If you do change your technique, do it slowly and do it for a long time. Don't just do it once and be like, it doesn't work. Of course it's not going to work the first time. You're not used to it. Change your technique for the better and then slowly watch your weights build up, and then eventually you'll learn that's probably the better technique anyway because it makes you the strongest and safest. Next point. You want a technique that is braced and stable. The highest forces are produced under a huge amount of stability, both for the whole body and the intra-abdominal region, the core. So what you want to do is brace, which means you <gasps> breathe in big, bear down around your entire abdomen, and what that allows you to do is produce the highest possible forces. And it doesn't really even matter if it's a lower body or upper body lift. It works in every single possible lift. So if you see in someone squat and they're breathing out while they're squatting down, that is a terrible idea. Before you squat, breathe in, <gasps> go down, come up, and maybe towards the last half of the lift, you can breathe out and yell something in Russian like I like to do. So in addition to that, because stability is huge, you want your feet to be super stable on the ground. If you watch a lot of really high level power lifters do their squat walkout, you'll notice they put their feet down and they'll do kind of like a little wiggle and a rub to really set their feet into the floor a ton. Critical, because if you're squatting 800 pounds, or in your case, two or three, 400 pounds, which is still super challenging, you don't want anything to wiggle down there because that's going to reduce your force production a ton. Your body's concerned with keeping you safe, first and foremost. So if it feels an instability, it reduces central drive. Your muscles don't activate as much. And then all of a sudden, you're missing lifts that you shouldn't be if you had taken the time to get really, really stable. It also means your shoulders should be stable. So a lot of times before you squat, you'll bring your shoulders back and lock them into place. So that's not a degree of freedom that can change during the lift. If you're lifting a lot and you're squatting a lot, let's say, and your shoulders start to round forward during the movement, good God, that throws off all kinds of stuff. And again, the instability just by itself is a real bad thing for your body's central ability to push your muscles. And of course, your hands, or you don't just grab the bench and go. What you want to do is knurl in and grab the bar, really settle in, find a real comfortable position that's stable, Chalk is a really good idea because then your hands don't slide. Great way to miss a bench press or just lower your max as your hands start to slide. Same with a deadlift. Some gifted people with huge hands and fingers can grip and rip. Most of us, if we want a big deadlift, we grip the bar, we take our time, we really settle in, whether you use hook, rip, or over, under, and then you go. Stability is absolutely the name of the game. And taking the time to become stable is a really good idea because like, what matters is you get the lift or get the reps that you want. It doesn't matter if you take an extra 30 seconds to set up, so there's never any rush. This means not only do you use chalk, like I mentioned, but you can uh, use some good shoes. This is where squatting shoes and deadlifting shoes come in handy really, really well because they're not, you know, I used to train, as a matter of fact, I've squatted over 400 pounds in uh, those like Nike shocks or whatever, and I've had a shock bust out during one of those squats. What a stupid move. Then I bought weightlifting shoes and they have like a, a wooden heel or I don't know, it's like some kind of composite heel. That's not busting anywhere. And all of a sudden my squat goes up because it's stable and it grips the ground super, super well. Lastly, you want to make sure 
that the requirements of the lift are met with the technique. So for the target lift, it has to meet competition standards and rules if you, two things, one, eventually do a competition, or two, take yourself seriously and have other people take you seriously at the gym. So if you're training for strength at the bench, don't go halfway down and be like, I just want a bigger bench. I don't care how much you do in competition because you're joking yourself. You're not actually benching. So for a good bench, make sure you come all the way down, ideally pause, come all the way up, pause for a second, and then rack. That's a real bench press. Most of your bench press should probably look like that if you want to get stronger at the bench press itself. Now, what about assistance lift technique? There's no like Bible of assistance work and how you're supposed to do it, but there are some hints that we can use to see what good technique is. First of all, good technique must challenge the movements and muscles that we want to improve. So if you're doing skull crushers in a way that you don't really feel in your triceps, uh, are you really making your triceps bigger or stronger? Probably not, so you have to alter your technique. For example, if you're skull crushing and you have pretty good flexibility and you're coming down like this and using your chest a lot, is that really the best skull crusher? No, because someone can ask you, hey, what are you using that for? Is it to just do another weird bench? No, it's for my triceps. Well, then bring your elbows in and come down to here, and all of a sudden, you're getting a lot of movement in this joint, not a ton in this joint, and it's going to be more enhanced. People do some techniques in the gym to enhance the strength of various muscles, or they do assistance work in a way that just doesn't make any damn sense. You're like, what do you think you're training with that? There has to be an obvious answer. Now, for muscle growth work. Because remember, you're gonna do some work in strength training that is just designed to grow those muscles bigger so then strength training can make them stronger later. For this hypertrophy work that we're doing, high range of motion and tension on the target muscle are key. So if you're trying to get uh, bigger quads for squatting and you're using leg presses, full range of motion is awesome. And make sure you feel it in your quads and not your adductors or something else like that, not your hamstrings, because the leg press is not a hamstring exercise. For subsystem strength work or what was true strength assistance lifts to bring up various parts of the strength movement, make sure there is a proper range of motion that actually challenges the subsystem you're training. For example, if you are doing deficit deadlifts because you are really weak from the ground, make sure the deficit is a big limiting factor for you, right? Let's say you figured out uh, a machine in the gym that really challenges your lockout ability, some kind of like pressing machine. And it really, you say, I'm doing this for lockouts. If the machine is hardest down here, uh, is it, and then the lockout super easy? You're kidding yourself. But if the machine is easy down here and then at the top, it's like, holy crap, that works exactly the subsystem that you want. And that's probably a better inclusion. Folks, if you follow those six tips for proper technique, you'll be well on your way. We'll see you next time for the next video.